Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. This is Jonah, and he's overboard. A few minutes ago, he was up here with these guys, but they threw him into the sea. To understand why, let's back up. Jonah was a prophet. He got messages from God and delivered them to people. God will restore our land. Everything was fine until God gave him this message. Dear Nineveh, in 40 days you will be destroyed. Jonah didn't like the message, and he really didn't like Nineveh. So he did what any of us might do when confronted with the clear, unchanging will of an all-powerful God. He ran. He ran in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And he didn't stop at the sea. He kept going on this boat with these guys. Until they realized that Jonah was the cause of this horrible storm that tossed their ship and they tossed him overboard. Well, happy Fourth of July weekend. How's everybody doing? Hope y'all had a good weekend celebrating our freedom, getting to hang out with friends and family. We're continuing to look at the book of Jonah this morning. So if you want to grab a Bible and start turning there, you can. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand right now and the ushers are coming down the aisle and be happy to give you one. If you don't own a Bible, please consider that our gift to you. Uh, Even as a preacher, I will confess that it's not easy to find the book of Jonah. It's kind of tucked away in the back of the Old Testament, so the easiest way I have found to find it is to use the table of contents. Uh, So use that as a reference. Uh, As you're finding Jonah, I will share with you this morning that Jill and I had the opportunity to host our new junior high pastor, Alec Beard, for dinner a few weeks ago. Uh, And if you have a seventh or eighth grade student, I just want to take a moment and say that your students are in good hands. Alec is an awesome young man. He's been on our staff for about a month and a half now, and I've really enjoyed getting to know him, and he is bringing a lot of excitement and a lot of energy to our seventh and eighth grade students, which is important because they have a lot of excitement and a lot of energy. So you need that as a junior high pastor. But uh, we had him for dinner a few weeks ago, and he was kind of asking Jill and I to recap our relationship, to take him back to the beginning, where it all started. And and so Jill and I began to share with him what I've shared in here before, and that's that Jill and I's relationship started as friends. We were friends for about two years, and then one day I wised up and realized, I need to ask this girl on a date. And so one night, it was a Sunday evening, we were coming back from visiting a friend who had just had surgery, and we pulled into her driveway. I put the car in park, and I asked Jill to go on a date with me. And in that moment, I was wise enough to recognize that if I had two years to think about asking her on a date, she might need a a little bit of time to give her answer. And so I said, take as much time as you need. And she did. She took three days to give me her answer. I was thinking 20 minutes, but that's fine. And when I tell this story, oftentimes, what gets left out is what happened during those three days. And so I'm gonna share that with you this morning, the behind the scenes look of what happened in my life during those three days. And what happened is things went from nervous excitement to uncomfortable and then to downright awkward. So you see, Sunday night, as I asked her on the date and was leaving the house, I was excited. I was a little nervous, anxious to hear what she was gonna say, but mostly excited. But on Monday, the mood began to shift a little bit. You see, at the time, I was our young adults pastor. And so Monday mornings for me meant that I was writing a sermon that I would preach on Thursday night. And Monday afternoons was me sending that sermon out for review. And I would send that to about five or six people, and Jill was on that team that would review the sermon. But what I failed to account for 
on Sunday night is that the sermon I was preaching Thursday night was on holiness in the context of dating. And so it was a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> as I was like, do I send the sermon to her? Do I not send the sermon to her? If I don't send the sermon to her, if she finds out that I didn't, is that gonna hurt my chances of getting a yes? It was a little bit uncomfortable, but I went with send her the sermon. So I did, and she reviewed it, gave me feedback. We got past it. That was Monday. On Tuesday, things got awkward. You see, on Tuesday night, we had a mutual friend's birthday dinner. And so we both arrived at the party, and as mature adults, we casually sat on opposite ends of the table. <laughs> and that was fine, until we realized that the group that was coming to the dinner was far larger than the table we were seated at, which meant that we had to move tables. And when we moved tables, there were only two seats left as Jill and I went to get our seats, and those were right next to each other. And so I'm like, how much do I engage in conversation with her? Should I just ask at this point, have you made up your mind? I, I didn't know what to do. And if that wasn't awkward enough, you can imagine how awkward it was when the waitress came at the end of the meal to divide up the checks, and this is 100% true. She asked me not once, not twice, but three times, are you guys together or separate? <laughs> I wanted to turn to Jill and just say, I don't know, are we? <laughs> Luckily, by Wednesday, Jill had made up your, her mind, and as you might have guessed, she said yes, and the rest is history. Now, the reason I share that with you this morning is because the part of the story that we're in with Jonah is a lot like me asking Jill on a date. You see, you, you all know the beginning of the story. It starts with me asking her on a date. And you could guess the end is her saying yes to that date. But again, this middle part, it doesn't get talked about much. And the same is true with what we're looking at in Jonah. You probably know the beginning of the story. In fact, it's in Jonah 1.17. It says, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We know this part of the story. If you've been around church much at all, you know that Jonah got swallowed by a whale. And if you've been around church, you probably know that Jonah doesn't stay in the whale forever. In fact, in Jonah 2.10, it tells us, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Jonah gets out of the whale. We know the beginning, we know the end, but what often doesn't get talked about is the middle part, the part where Jonah is inside the whale. And so that's what I want us to look at this morning, is what happened when Jonah was in the whale. And it's found in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Let's read it. It says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love to them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. If you're a note taker, there's three things I want us to focus on this morning from this prayer. And the first thing I want us to focus on is Jonah's situation. And Jonah's not gonna hide his situation from us. In fact, in the nine verses that we just read, 12 different times, he's gonna make reference to his situation. And none of them are good. He says, I was in distress. I was in the realm of the dead. Waters were washing over me. 
And if that wasn't bad enough, he goes on to say, seaweed was wrapped around my head. And I don't know about you, but I have sensory issues. And so when I go to Galveston or to Florida and I'm in the ocean, if seaweed like brushes up against my leg, I'm out of there. Like that's, that's the end for me. So I cannot imagine what it's like to have seaweed wrapped around your head. And this isn't in the text. This is free for you this morning, but it was dark in the whale. We can assume that. I'm not positive it was seaweed. I'm thinking it was like some fish guts, and he was like, it's seaweed, it's seaweed, okay? (laughs) But we see Jonah's situation, right? And it is not a good situation. And I believe the reason that Jonah spent so much time, so much time saying, I want you to know where I was at, and it was not good, is because he wants us to understand a deep truth that he experienced, And that's that a life apart from God is a life that's wasting away. A life apart from God is a life that's wasting away. I mean, you saw it in the video, but Jonah was running from God. He was moving away from God. He was separating from God. And the picture that he's trying to paint this morning is that the farther I ran, the more I separated myself from God, the more my life began to waste away. And I wonder this morning, if someone was painting a picture of your life, if you were to describe your situation, I wonder if you wouldn't say something similar to Jonah. I mean, you might not use water metaphors to describe it, but you might say something like, I'm at the end of my rope. I I don't know where else to turn. I'm living in a cycle or a pattern of behaviors that I don't know how to correct. Uh, My life is wasting away. In fact, some of you, that might be why you're here this morning. Some of you, you might not have a relationship with God. This church thing that you're doing this morning is very foreign to you. Maybe you just were driving to HEB or Kroger this week and passed by. Maybe you've been coming by every day on the way to work and you thought, you know what, I should give that church thing a try. Maybe in your mind you realize your life is kind of like a 4th of July firework. It goes up into the sky and there's a brilliant flash of light. It's beautiful for a moment. But when that moment goes away, what's left is darkness, smoke, and burnt pieces of paper on the ground. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been invited by a friend Maybe they've invited you week after week, month after month, and they've told you all about how God has changed their life, and you think, you know, I'd like a change. And so you're here this morning. Maybe you're here and you've got a relationship with God. You've been doing this church thing for a while, but you're Jonah. And you know deep down, I've been running away from God. And my guess is that didn't happen overnight. It was probably a slow fade where you stopped reading your Bible You stopped praying, your church attendance dropped a little bit, and slowly but surely, the world began to overtake you, and you became separated from God. Maybe it started with a couple of small lies. Those lies had to turn into bigger lies to cover the small lies, and at this point, you don't know what's true and what's false. Maybe it's that you started looking at images on your cell phone pornographic images, and it started with once a month. Now it's every week, maybe every day, and you can't reverse the trend. Maybe it's that after a hard day of work, you come home and have a glass of wine, but the days got harder, and the glass of the wine became more frequent, and now instead of one glass, it's two. Instead of two, it's the whole bottle, and you can't go back. Maybe it's a relationship with someone that's not your spouse, It was a coworker that started out as someone that you just had things in common with. And those things in common turned into text messages and eventually meeting for drinks after work and then eventually a full-blown affair. And you say, I don't know how to get out of this. Or maybe it's not that extreme of an example. Maybe it's just the truth that sin is simply this. It's anything that separates us from God. It's any time that we choose our best instead of God's best. And so maybe this morning, that's what it is for you. It's just that as you look at the trajectory of your life, you realize 
I'm going down some patterns. I'm doing some things that aren't God's best. It could be the way that you interact with your spouse. Maybe as you look at the trajectory of that interaction, you would say, you know, I haven't been that loving. I mean, if I'm honest, maybe my patience is wearing a little thin. I've responded harshly this week. Or maybe it's in the midst of a conflict. You can't admit that you're wrong. You can't seek forgiveness. Maybe it's envy. Maybe it's that you're jealous of your coworker, the one who keeps getting the promotions all the while you're getting passed over. Maybe it's the friend that just got married and you're jealous because you're single and it doesn't look like that's changing anytime soon. Maybe it's comparison that leads to gluttony. You can't look at your neighbor's house, you can't look at their car, the latest piece of technology that they've gotten and not say, I need that. And though I can't afford it, I'm gonna buy it anyway because I gotta keep up with the Joneses. Or maybe what's separating from you from God is simply this. You've been on summer vacation and as you've traveled, you just haven't had time to connect with God. I don't know what the picture that's painted this morning is in your life, but my guess is to some degree, all of us can relate to Jonah's situation. All of us have experienced at one time or another that life apart from God is a life that's wasting away. And the good news for us this morning is that that's not the only thing we glean from this text. You see, the second thing that we take from this text is that there's a solution to Jonah's situation. There's a solution to his situation. Look what he says. He uses repetition again, and the solution, he says, is that he called to the Lord. He said he looked to the holy temple. He said, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer rose to him. That's the solution to Jonah's situation. It was to cry out to God. And I think instinctively we know that that's a solution to our situation. Now, I mean, take the most extreme example. Suppose that you boarded a plane today and the pilot midway through the flight comes over the air and says, bad news, this plane's going down. There's gonna be two responses in that moment. Either you're gonna hear profanity that I can't say from this stage, or you're gonna hear people calling out to God. Even if they've never called out to God before, they're gonna say, God, help me. God, save us. There's nowhere else to turn in that moment. We know instinctively that the solution to our worst situations is God. And a few weeks ago, I learned of a real life example of this. We had a faith bridger who emailed in to our lead team and said, hey, I wanna share my story with you about what God's been doing in my life. And what he began to share with us was that he grew up in church, but he never had a relationship with God. In fact, church was just a thing he did and he kept God at a distance because he had some hurts growing up, some things that had happened to him. And so growing up throughout high school, college, he stayed away from God, except for those moments when he was at his lowest. In those moments, he would cry out to God. And one of those moments happened about five years ago. You fast forward in his life, he's married, he's got two beautiful daughters, and one of those low moments came when his wife uncovered a pornography addiction that he had been struggling with for years. And in that moment, he said, I I didn't have any other option but to cry out to God. He said, only this time, I wasn't crying out to God to save my marriage. I was crying out to God to save me. He said, I need God in my life. I need a rescuer in my life. And this is the only option. I can't save myself any longer. And you know, really deep down, isn't that what we all need? Isn't what we all need is a rescuer? Because if you're like me, you've tried to rescue yourself. You've tried several times to to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And what you find if you do that long enough is it doesn't work. When it comes right down to it, deep down, beneath the pressing issues of our life, we need God. 
We need a rescuer. We need salvation. We need a solution to our situation. But I think the reason that we cry out to God is because of the third thing we see in this text. And that's the resolution. Again, Jonah is gonna use repetition, but look what he says. He says, I called to the Lord and he answered me. I sank down, but you brought my life from the pit. Salvation comes from the Lord. And that's the hope we have today, that when we call to God, he answers. It doesn't matter how far you've run, it doesn't matter what things you've done, it doesn't matter how deep you think the pit you're standing in is. When you call to God, he answers. No matter how messy the painting looks, God can take something that is a disaster and turn it into something beautiful. And the reason I know that is because of this faith bridger. He continued on in his story and he said, when I called out to God, I heard him speaking to me for the first time. He's saying what Jonah said, that when he called to God, the Lord answered him. And God didn't just answer him, he rescued him. He brought salvation to this man. Scripture talks about when we accept Christ, we become a new creation. And that's what happened to this man. His life began to change. His marriage began to heal. His relationships with his daughters were restored. And that didn't happen immediately, it was a process. It happened with him getting in community. But the Lord saved this man. The Lord rescued this man, and that's the power that our God has. He has the ability to make beauty from ashes. And when you experience that, when you experience God pulling you from the pit, there's only one response, and it's the response we see from Jonah. If you look at verse eight, Jonah says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Our response to an amazing resolution like that is grateful praise. But, but you see, the difference between our response and Jonah's response is that Jonah continued with his response. Did you see that in the text? He says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Because you see, in Jonah's day, when there was sin in your life, you had to pay for that sin. Something had to be done to make things right between you and God, and that something was to sacrifice the blood of an innocent lamb. And so Jonah and people like him would make a sacrifice to God to say, look, I'm paying for the price of my sin. But you see, the difference between Jonah and us is that somebody's done that for us. Somebody has paid the sacrifice for us. And that someone is Jesus. You see, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders and he says, you remember that story about Jonah? That's not just a story about Jonah. And in fact, that's a story about me. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jonah say, or Jesus says this. He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus came to be the sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came to live the life of perfection that we could not, to pay the price of sin for us. Jesus came to be the solution and the resolution to our situation. In Ephesians, Paul says this, he says that now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away can be brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the message of Jesus that those of us who are far from God can be brought near by his sacrifice. And the truth is, Paul goes on in Romans and he talks about that all of us are broken. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that every person in this room is broken. All of us have walked away from God. All of us have turned our back on God. But because of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made, we can be brought near. That's what's called the gospel, the good news. And it's because of that good news that we take communion. 
You see, communion is just a symbol. It's a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made. It's why we take bread and break it to remind us of the body of Christ that was broken for us. It's why we take a cup with juice to remind us of the blood of Christ that was shed. And so this morning, we're going to participate in communion. And really when it gets down to it, the purpose of communion is threefold. First, communion is an invitation. For those of you who are in the room that would say, I'm not in a relationship with God. This church thing is really pretty new to me. This table down here, down in front, represents an invitation. It's an invitation to enter into a relationship with Christ. It's an invitation to cry out to God. It's to say, God, I'm messed up. I'm broken. But if you're offering rescue, I want to be rescued. If you're offering freedom, I want to be set free. And so this table for you, friends, is an invitation. And so in just a moment, when the ushers lead us, I want you to come forward and partake in communion. And then I want to invite you to talk to one of our prayer partners who will be up front about what it looks like to be in a relationship with Christ. The second thing that communion serves as is a reminder. It's a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And it's a reminder for those of you who are in the room that say, you know, I I have a relationship with God. In fact, I've heard this message a hundred times, but the truth of the matter is I'm far from God right now. Sin has entered into my life, or maybe it's the summer vacation, and I don't feel very close to God right now. And the reminder for you this morning is that the blood of Christ is what brings us near to God. And so as you come forward to partake in communion, it's a reminder to confess To say, God, I've been doing life my own way, but God, I want to depend on you. It's a chance to repent, to turn away from the things that have distracted us from our relationship with God. The third thing that communion is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to respond like Jonah, with grateful praise. And I'll confess to you this morning that when you've been around church a while, When you've heard this message so many times, sometimes our ears can kind of just turn off when we hear the gospel. Sometimes we can forget how great the gift of grace really is. And if that's you this morning, I just want to invite you to pray that sweet hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, the moment I first believed. That you would ask God, God, would you just restore to me the freshness of salvation? Remind me of the greatness of that this gift of grace really is. And so really for all of us, it's an opportunity to respond with grateful praise. And so my prayer this morning as we enter into communion that for some of us in this room, it is an invitation. It's an invitation to enter in to a relationship with God. For others, it's a reminder. And for all of us, it's an opportunity to respond with grateful praise. Let's pray this morning. Well, God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. God, I thank you that because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross, we can be brought near to you. God, that we can enter into a relationship with you. And that's where life is found, God. Life with you is a life worth living. Life apart from you is a life that's wasting away. And so, God, right now, this morning, I just pray for my friends that are in the room that would say they're not in relationship with you. Maybe they came to church for the first time. Maybe it's the first time in a long time. They're like that faith bridger who had been in church his whole life but never had a relationship with you. And if that's you right now, I just want to give you a chance to talk to God. And it doesn't have to be anything complex. It could be like Jonah who just said, I called to God and he answered. Just call out to God and say, God, I need you. I need you in my life to restore. I need you in my life to rescue me from the pit that I've created. Do that now.
For others in this room, I, I just want to give you a moment to talk to God, to say, God, maybe you're in that second group that just needs to remember the gospel. You've been running away from God. You've been far from God for whatever reason. And just give you a moment to, to, to cry out to God, to say, God, I confess that, that I've gone my own way, but I want to be back in relationship with you. I want to come back home today. Take a moment right now and, and just confess your dependence on him. God, we need you. God, I pray in this moment as we have the opportunity now to respond with grateful praise. Lord, would you allow us to do that? God, would you clear out the distractions? So many times I know I confess this myself. Lord, I, I come in here and I'm thinking about what's next. I'm thinking about the week ahead. I'm thinking about what's for lunch. And God, I, I just pray in this moment that you would center our lives on you. Allow this to be a holy moment where we connect with you, where we praise you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for that sacrifice. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at FaithBridge, sitting here with Michael Sullivan, who just preached a second part in our series, Jonah, the Depth of God's Love, called The Forgotten Prayer. And we have a few questions in about it. Uh, one that I'm going to summarize down to kind of the, the summary statement of it. And it was, um, does God send people into sin to rescue them? Uh, I'll give a short answer and then explain. Uh, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look at the context of the whole story of Jonah and remember that Jonah's sin actually happened in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And that was when he was running uh, from God. He was being disobedient to the call of God. Right. That was actually his sin. Um, the whale was actually, or the big fish, was actually God's vehicle to rescue him. Uh, in fact, I think God gave a couple of vehicles to rescue him, the, the, uh, the boat, the storm. He was using all of these things to wake Jonah up. Right. Uh, and so the whale is actually God's use of rescue. Now, that doesn't seem like much of a rescue to us, but in, in reality it was. He was sinking down. He was out of there, and, and God sends this whale to rescue him. I think I would maybe... Um, equate it if, if you are caught in sin. We'll go with one of the examples I used today was an affair. Right. Um, God does not send you into the affair. It's mm -hmm. the actions of disobedience that get you there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the midst of that affair, I think a whale or a big fish in that example might be a friend who calls you out, who mm -hmm. catches you in the act um, or something like that. And then in the moment, that probably feels like getting swallowed like a whale. You mm -hmm. don't Oftentimes, when we are caught in sin, uh, we get frustrated by that. A lot of times, we don't like to own it. Um, you see that all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, when we sin, we try to cover, we try to hide, we try to run. And so, um, no, I don't think God is sending him into sin. I think that was actually the vehicle God was using to get him out of the sin, uh, right. there being the whale. So. Right. That makes, makes sense. That's good. Well, our second question that we have in um, is Jonah's brokenness in the belly of the whale is brought to him, uh, uh, is brought him to the point of realizing his need for God and crying out again. Uh, this person says, for me, the gospel only becomes too familiar and unmeaningful when life is going good because we lose the sense of our brokenness. How do you practically remember uh, the daily need for God when our lives are going well, when we're prospering and when we're not in the belly of a whale? Yeah, and that, that is a good challenge. I mean, uh, I don't remember who said it, but a lot of times until we're in the valley of a, you know, in the valley, does it force us to look up? When you're mm -hmm. up on the mountains, sometimes it's, it's hard yeah. to look up. So that is a good challenge. Uh, I think I might offer up a couple of things. Um, one is to stay on mission. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Um, one of the things that we'll see going into the rest of this chapter is Jonah is going to get back on mission. And I think when we're out sharing the gospel with others, doing what God has called us to, it puts us in touch mm -hmm. with the brokenness of the world uh, and can be a reminder of our mm -hmm. own brokenness. So we're not better than those people, uh, but to use an example, uh, we're just a hungry person who's found food and trying to bring people in yeah. to that. So I think staying on mission is one thing. I think another thing is community. It's to be around people who can challenge and sharpen you. I think it is easy to get complacent. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to think, oh, I'm checking the right boxes. But uh, when you're in community, you can be and in relationships. I think that's where uh, sometimes our, our sin that we bury comes to the surface is typically in relationships. Um, I think a third thing is just asking the Lord. Um, that's what I find for myself. You know, even today, Lord, would you remind me of your amazing grace? Because it is easy when you've heard uh, something over and over and over again to forget the weight and the impact of it. And so it's just to ask God, would you make this new? I mean, every morning, God, would you remind me of your gospel? I think you see that from Paul as he's writing to uh, the Ephesians. Uh, a lot of times when he writes to Philippians, he says, I'm praying for you guys, mm -hmm. not into Galatians. All of his churches, he'll say, I'm praying that you remember the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, that's why he repeats that over and over, because it is easy to forget. And so um, I think that's what I would offer up for that person. Yeah, that constant prayer of, will you 